All right, welcome you all to the 2020 CHAM++ workshop. Uh, this is the 18th annual workshop uh, on, on CHAM++ and applications. Over the years, it has evolved to include other adaptive runtime systems, of course, our own adaptive MPI. And, um, and, but then the broad theme of the workshop will remain on runtime adaptivity as we go forward. Um, I'm going to just make a few brief uh, remarks at the beginning before we get on to the uh, first keynote. Um, the workshop webpage is shown here. This is of course a virtual event. Normally we have had this in April, end of April, beginning of May. Um, this year, of course, uh, we ended up uh, postponing that with some op optimism about uh, doing it later and then decided to do it virtually now, um, which probably shifts it into this October position for next year onwards. We had done one shift once with, from October to March in early years. And uh, so may maybe we will do this. We'll take input from all, all of you and, uh, before we decide. I am excited to have uh, three keynotes. Which normally we have two keynotes and one, one for each day and then one um, panel discussion. Uh, we bumped the panel discussion this year, but I'm uh, fortunate to have all three of the keynote speakers whom I've been trying to uh, get for the CHAM workshop while finally uh, here this year. Uh, the uh, The, of course, as you know, no need to say that the workshop proceedings are being webcast like they have been for the past few years, but this year, that's the only way in which we, this workshop is being conducted. And we will also record this. I probably should have gotten some um, um, uh, permissions from the speaker. So those of you who don't want the recording to be on our YouTube channel later on or uh, on the website, uh, please let uh, Jamin know, uh, let, uh, Jamin, uh, Chai and Matthias Diener are the two uh, co-chairs, uh, program co-chairs uh, for this year's workshop. And uh, they have done an excellent job in putting the program together. Uh, with uh, initiative from Matthias, we actually got easy chair set up this year for the first time uh, for submitting abstracts and uh, looks like that has worked well. And so we, we will continue that process as, uh, as well in future. Um, so before I go, go further, are there any questions about logistics of the workshop? Feel free to ask them in the chat channel, which I assume is open and, uh, uh other people, uh, Jamin and Thais will be happy to answer, answer those questions there for you. Um, Let's see, yes, this is, I went to the, all the past workshops are on our website. You can look at all the slides. And you can look at all the presentation videos too for at least starting with some, some year that I don't remember. Uh, I tried one random year and the, uh, the, the video format was a little um, uh, old for the player that I was trying. So we might want to, uh, we might move them to our YouTube channel um, sometime in Jamin. At the end, would you, uh, you will announce the YouTube channel. I would like people to have a link to that on the web, web maybe we'll put it on the website uh, for the workshop. Um, for any, anyone else that you want to invite to attend the workshop, it is free. We ask for registration just so that I can get the information to you uh, about, about the details of the workshop and how to join and so on but registration is not required. The password and the link is posted there at the workshop link. Um, so normally I begin this uh, workshop by uh, doing a short introduction to CHAM++ in the fond hope that there are people who, um, uh, who, who have not uh, been introduced to CHAM++ before but also kind of try out my newer and uh, newer uh, attempts at quick uh, uh, introduction to CHAM++ with nice visualization. So we will see one such uh, today. So uh, for those of you who don't know, please pay attention because it's going to be in a couple of minutes, two or three minute introduction to the entire CHAM++ idea. 
So Champ Plus Plus computation in the program is running consists of multiple collections of globally visible objects. So each collection here, we've shown two collections, uh, a green collection and a whatever that other color is collection, grayish. Um, and, and each collection is individually indexed. These indices can be one dimensional or multidimensional. They can be sparse or contiguous and they can be um, even things like string indexed by strings and bit vectors. Although that's rare, uh, but bit vectors do get used. Uh, point is objects are recognized by their collection name and their index. And they communicate with each other just using those uh, names by asynchronous method invocations. That means they don't necessarily wait for a return value from those method invocations. Now in reality, of course, they don't exist in ether. They, there have to be real grounding and there are processors and nodes in the system and a runtime system assigns those objects to processors. And uh, once there are some number of objects on a processor, the question arises, who is going to decide uh, what runs next? And uh, for that, uh, there is a scheduler. So first point first, programmers don't need to know where an object you want to communicate with is located. Second, who runs next is decided by the scheduler and whoever runs next runs their method invocations pre, non preemptively. So scheduling is under the control of a user space scheduler uh, and it works with a one or more queues of messages. Uh, suppose this top object uh, on processor zero wants to communicate with the bottom right object uh, uh, somewhere here. Well, it doesn't know where it is, but it knows its index and it, uh, it carries out, it hands over the method invocation for A sub uh, 23 to the runtime system, which packages it, puts it in an envelope with the right address, uses a distributed location manager to tentatively figure out where it is, almost always it is correct, uh, uh, but, it, but the, the protocols to handle when it is not correct. And then the uh, message gets sent to that processor where it sits wait, patiently waiting for its uh, turn in the queue. When the scheduler eventually picks it up, it invokes the method, it finds out the object is still, if it is still there, otherwise forwards the message to it, uh, delivers the invocation, lets it run to completion, in the process, it might generate more messages that go to the other processors and executions uh, continue on in this fashion. Now, the runtime system knows some objects are heavy, some objects are light, as who is talking to whom, and using that information, it can migrate uh, objects around to accomplish things such as load balancing, things such as shrinking and expanding set of nodes used by the, uh, by the simulation and so on. So this is where you get most of the flexibility. And this picture is meant to say, and the objects continue computing like that um, happily um, ever after. So, uh, so that's the execution model of CHAM++. Uh, underneath CHAM++, and this whole message-driven execution is enabled by a system called Converse. Converse is a system that has, uh, that schedules uh, tasks you might call today. And these work units can be user level threads as well as stackless tasks, which we can call tasklets. Um, and, and this scheduler, which is running on each hardware thread, if there is two SMT, you can run it on each of them, for example. And this fine grained scheduler is one of the reasons and one of the um, reasons for the full flexibility that the whole runtime system offers. Converse is from 1996. It's still being used in CHAM++. Um, if you want to look for a modern equivalent, uh, it's Argobots. Uh, we participate in the design of Argobots. Uh, eventually, if, we, if some of the things that we are thinking about work out, then eventually we may merge into Ar Ar Argobots, converse into Argobots and use that for CHAM++. But uh, functionality-wise, converse has accumulated significant uh, different functionalities that are needed by the CHAM++ ecosystem, including for adaptive MPI, which is an MPI implemented on top of uh, CHAM++, these user level threads are migratable across nodes. And that's a capability we need to add and, and a few others. Um, so, so that's the basic charm execution model. 
And as uh, I've shown before, this ideas of over decomposition in CHAMP++ and message driven execution and migratability, and based on that intro introspective and adaptive runtime system actually lead to a variety of benefits, uh, including like power and energy optimizations or fault tolerance, I already mentioned dynamic load balancing. And the fact that you know what's running next can lead to a variety of things like perfect prefetch and so on and so forth. Um, so, so these capabilities are mentioned here, um, some of them. Then uh, the programming systems developed on top of this runtime is of course, in addition to CHAMP++, there is adaptive MPI, which is a full-fledged MPI implementation. I will say a bit more about it uh, later. CHAMP for Pi, which, can, uh, which is evolving towards the uh, well-supported uh, implementation at CharmWorks. Charades, which is uh, being renamed to CharmDes, which is a discrete event simulation uh, system. And then there are several experimental languages and you'll hear a bit about them in the workshop uh, as well. Uh, and I, I, I really, those of you into language design, uh, CHAMP++ and Converse are an excellent substrate for designing your own uh, higher level languages with adaptive runtime basis. Um, one of the uh, uh, useful things you can uh, you get from that is composability. Different modules can interleave their execution uh, on nodes uh, when they're written with this run message to a runtime system. Uh, many example applications, there are dozens. I just listed a few here uh, of the most well-known, maybe NAMD, but there are uh, several, several others and you hear from some of them uh, today and tomorrow. Um, there are application papers. I just thought uh, since the slides will be there that maybe if you if I want to point just a few papers to look at, those would be uh, some examples, but there are many more on our website. Um, so, well, I, and just a brief a point about uh, current state. We have work on energy control by turning cores on and off dynamically that happened last year. Adaptive MPI is now substantially uh, improved and uh, at a point where you can just use it for your MPI application without worrying too much uh, about anything. You, uh, we have automatic ways of running MPI code virtualize this one thing that MPI, AMPI needs is encapsulation of your global variables, which is a good thing in general, but most codes don't have it and we provide it automatically. New codes can easily accommodate this uh, in, in the way they write it. So as with standard compliance, with performance, with automatic ways of uh, uh, running MPI codes, it is uh, well uh, near a production uh, system and being used. Um, communication optimizations is something that I hope you'll hear a bit about in the, uh, in the, uh, in the workshop, but uh, the over decomposition automatically gives you the ability to spread communication over time, but multiple cores and GPGPUs add some nuances to it. You will hear about that. Um, I, I will, since I'm running out of time, I will not uh, say much about this. Then some grants, uh, I will mention um, Astro Trees for uh, cosmology, Prevents is for uh, storm surge simulations uh, and energy optimization at AMPI I already mentioned. Uh, Michael Robson's PhD thesis was finished last year and he, you will hear from uh, that project as well. And at Chamworks, uh, there are many projects that are proceeding. Um, the, uh, uh, the, in addition to the AMPI, which we will be renamed uh, and relaunched as Charm MPI and Charades, which will be uh, launched as Charm Des. Um, and the, and, and so those are the things that are coming from Chamworks. Uh, probably worth clarifying the relationship with Chamworks. Chamworks is a spin-off from, uh, from our university research group. Uh, and the hope is that it will do more engineering uh, work there and uh, leave us to do research uh, in, in, our, uh, in our group. Although historically the strength of our research group has been the engineering work that we do. So we'll hopefully continue to do that. Uh, as, as well at, at Illinois. Uh, the versions, the CHAMP++ is, uh, an, uh, is uh, certainly available uh, for all nonprofits uh, through the university. And that will continue to be so, and we are merging up all the work that we are doing at uh, CHAMP work so far. 
I'm uh, announcing a weekly webinar series starting next week, but the details of that are not quite fixed. So uh, watch this space. Uh, maybe by tomorrow I'll fix some details and announce them. Uh, the workshop itself, um, we have a keynote by uh, Jeffrey Vetter today. We have um, talks on CFD um, on, on the Kinoa project we, uh, and uh, by Joseph Bakosi's team. We have Lawrence Rauschberger talk about his graph processing. There's going to be three talks from three completely different groups on uh, uh, cosmologies. For whatever reason, cosmology has emerged as a uh, area where there are many Champ++ plus plus, uh, based codes. Electronic structure, uh, open atom, there'll be two talks on that. Uh, storm surge simulations, there'll be a, a joint talk uh, on that today. And um, the, uh, the system talks on adaptive MPI and loop parallelism. Tomorrow, there'll be uh, keynotes by Hartman and uh, John, uh, John uh, Melkrami. Uh, there'll be talks on Dharma system, a couple, a couple of them actually. Uh, Talk by Abhinav uh, Batele and uh, and Jamin Choi and GPGPUs and languages and uh, on vector load balancing by Aronak uh, and uh, and there'll be an MD talk and then in the end we'll have some sort of a user group discussion preceded by the release of the uh, next version of Champ Plus uh, Plus. That is all I wanted to say. I will stop with that. <laughs>